And you may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis. It starts in the 45th chapter, verse 3. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. As you're able, would you please stand as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body. Amen.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you. We thank you for our lives, for our community, for our friends, for the fellowship of our church, and the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christianity in this world. But God, we also have some fear. Oh, we worry about a lot of things. We worry about the price of gas, price of electricity, our health, whether our car will go on the next trip or not. We worry about bigger things the safety of our country, the safety of our community, the safety of our nation. But maybe, God, we don't worry enough about whether our relationship with you is where you'd like it to be. Maybe our focus is on stuff we can see And not on the amazing hand that you have to fix it all. So God, we come before you humbly, broken, sometimes sick, sometimes dealing with struggles beyond our control. And we ask you to forgive us. We come together as a community to ask for forgiveness for the way we have treated others or failed to treat people when we should. For the times the church, not this church particularly, but the church in general has pushed people away instead of inviting them in. For the times we forget what a gift it is to have you as our Savior and God. This time of year as we approach Lent, maybe we're a little bit more sorrowful, a little more thoughtful, but we need Lent to help us refocus reformat and rethink the things that we need to be worried about. So today as we gather, we ask for your forgiveness and your grace. We're willing. You're calling. And sometimes we just get into a place where we don't know what to say and we do the same thing the disciples did. We look up to Jesus and say, well, you just teach us to pray. 
And he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you're able, would you please stand as we sing together, This is my Father's world and remain standing for the reading of the gospel. strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much as you can. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is, the, he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, or you will be... Ju do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. Where's Lily? Is she back there? Hey, Lily. Come here a minute. Please. I was just 
<laughs> Do you know what the golden rule is? Always love God the most. That's close. Do unto others as you got them to unto you. Remember that one? You knew that already. I just put you on the spot. I'm sorry. You can go sit down. <laughs> Y'all know the golden rule, right? Yep. I think I have a marble that has it on it, doesn't it? Yep. I ought to ask all the men that have those to hold them up, but then they'd have to all pay. I won't do that. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> when I... Uh, when I read this scripture, I thought to myself, and this was on Monday before a lot of things happened this week. I thought to myself, boy, if there's ever a scripture we need to hear, it's this, especially in this time where we live right now. Amen. And then on TV the other night, and y'all know there's big controversy about the skater from Russia that she was doping or not doping or whatever the deal was, right? She should, in my opinion, my opinion only, this is not a Methodist opinion, it's mine, shouldn't have, read, shouldn't have been allowed to skate. But regardless of that, it didn't matter anyway because she didn't win. She came in fourth. <coughs> and they left her alone. Did y'all see the pictures? 15-year-old girl left there, not one coach, not one person, nobody, put their arms around her, said, it's okay, sweetheart, try again next year. Nobody got near her. So it's easy for me. I can judge them. Well, that's the way the Russians are. But let me tell you, there were Norwegians and Americans and everybody else in that room. Anybody could have gone. Yep. And they just let her sit there and hurt. This is not a political statement, friends. This is a humanitarian statement. She was hurting somebody, anybody could have reached out. Amen. And you know what worries me? Is everybody's hurt getting on the news or getting on the TV. It didn't slide up right there in front of everybody for them to see. Because I can tell you, some people we know are hurting just like that. And we're not reaching out to them either. So here we are, I don't know, two point some odd billion Christians in the world. And if the golden rule is true, did we do unto her the way we want to be treated? Because it clearly also points out in this scripture, you get what you sow. It's extremely saddening to me to see people alone. And let me tell you, friends, you can be alone in a crowd. People are hurting. And some of what we see in the behavior that's going on around us right now is their pain. And it could be somewhat resolved if somebody cared. Part of the problem is the rules have changed. You, some of you may have seen this. I put it on Facebook. It's not new. It's been around for a long time. But I can't remember the coach's name. But some years ago, there was a coach invited to talk to a coach's meeting. There were thousands of people in the room. He was an old guy. He was in his 90s. He went up there and he was wearing a home plate around his neck. And he delivered a pretty good speech. And everybody in the audience is kind of going, this old guy's got a home plate around his neck. Finally, he said, I guess y'all noticed I have home plate around my neck. So he said, how big, how wide is home plate in Little League? Some of you know the answer, maybe. 17 inches. 17 inches. How wide is home plate in the regular Little League? 17 inches. 17 inches. How wide is it in high school? 17. It's still 17 inches. In college, too, in the, the minor leagues, even in the pros, home plate is 17 inches. 
There's one thing you can know about baseball if you're watching it. The home plate is 17 inches wide. Now, over the years, guy makes it to the pros. He can't throw over that 17-inch home plate. Do they make it wider for him? No. Some batter hits too, too easy off that 17-inch plate. Do they make it smaller for him? No. I want to tell you, the gospel is like that home plate. It hasn't changed. Now, I've got to tell you, little leaguers don't throw at the same speed that major, major leaguers do. There's a lot of differences in the way the game gets played. But there's one constant you know if you're going to play baseball. The plate's 17 inches wide. The constant in God's kingdom is that there's more good than there is evil. There's more grace than there is sin. And that has always been true. It's going to continue to be true. And we need to focus way more there than we are on all the stuff, whatever it is we're focused on. Churches. Well, let's start with schools. They changed the rules, right? They made it easier and easier. Oh, that's too hard for our kids. We've got to do this. My mother quit teaching when she was, after 38 years of teaching because of House Bill 72, whenever that was at that past. When she started teaching, she would have, in the same room, she would have reading and science. She was an elementary school teacher, second grade. Science and reading and music all going on at the same time. And if the kids got rowdy, you know what she did? She said, okay, kids, let's go outside. Here's a ball. Kick it around until they got tired enough to bring them back in because they weren't learning anything anyway. House Bill 72 said she couldn't do that anymore. She had to teach what somebody else told her to teach. She had to teach it in a certain way. And I substituted teaching once. I want to tell you, there's a lot more to it than just showing up being there with kids all day. They got curriculums to plan and stuff to do. And it's, it's not what they thought it was. Let me tell you about the church. In my youth, in the 50s, you wouldn't run across anybody in this community or any other one around here that didn't attach themselves to a church. And then churches decided, well, we've got to be fancier and bigger. And they went into debt. And then the preacher might get up and preach the gospel and some Big giver might say, well, preacher, I don't like it when you talk that way. If you keep doing that, I believe in the church. So we took the gospel home plate and we just widened it to include anything. Now, don't get me wrong. I think a live reading of the gospel means we don't necessarily react to things today the way we did in 1950 or 1930 or in 1800, but some parts of it, the message from it, is constant, true, and never changes. It's really pretty simple, isn't it? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Treat people fair. Love one another. See, we got more concerned with building big things. I loved watching when Robert Schuler went from a drive-in movie theater with his uh, church to, to the Crystal Cathedral. I thought, whoa, what a fantastic thing he did. And, and I'm going to tell you, I think he did some good stuff. Until he didn't. The foundation of the church shouldn't be on the preacher. It shouldn't even necessarily be on the building. One of my friends up in Jacksonville today, they're having church with no lights because their lighting system has to have a cooling thing working around it, and the cooling thing went out. They still got the screen. They still got loud speakers, but they're in the dark. And what the preacher said, if you want to use a hymnal today, you better bring a flashlight. It 
It isn't really about that. I mean, I know the, the building looks different now than it used to. That We've changed. But you know, some things about it, you can still drive down to the corner of Lily and Holly since 1937 and hear a gospel message. So when I say the, the rules change, I'm not talking about the gospel change. Our approach to the gospel changed, and sometimes we totally forgot about what it was about. Churches built these big, phenomenal playgrounds and huge education wings so they could entertain the children while their parents went to church. And I think if you check me out on this, that really started in the late 50s and went until about the 80s. And I would tell you that's the generation of children we're missing in the church right now. Yep. All of the studies, every study I've ever read says the children, once they reach school age, if they come to the sanctuary for church, I know sometimes they're going to make noise, and sometimes they're going to do stuff, but I'm talking about from first grade up, if they come to the church, then when they get older, they come back. Yep. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Jesus goes into some, so Luke reports some pretty strong stuff here, doesn't he? Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. <coughs> do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love who, those who love them. If you do good only to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies, do good, lend. Expect nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, but merciful to you. Yeah, we live in troubled times. There's a lot of stuff going on. We can easily get focused on that. One of the things that I love about golf is that it requires me to think about that and not anything else. Now, if I don't do that, I play very poorly. Because there's a lot of things you've got to remember. For those of you that never played golf, you've got to stand sort of a certain way. You've got to hold the club a certain way. You've got to watch the ball because you can't hit something you can't see. You've got to vary sometimes your swing because of how far you want to hit it. You've got a lot of stuff going on. And if I was any good at it, I can be on the pro tour. But I'm not. It doesn't mean I quit and I don't try and I don't keep trying to do it. I'm not going to be Tiger Woods in this lifetime. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you're, you get out there and you're, even though we compete with each other when we play, the, 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 what you're really competing with is yourself. Is can I keep my mind on what I'm doing? And I bring that up simply to tell you, I think that's kind of what's going on in the world right now. We, we need to be focused on the things that really matter to us. Now, it's pretty important to me to be involved in God's kingdom work. How about you? Now, I don't always know how to do that. It's even gotten harder now because I used to know, you know, we went down and mentored at the school. I could get done with my 30 minutes or an hour there and I could say, well, I did something good for the world today. We don't get to do that. You know, I could, we, I could go and take some money that we collect up to the Methodist Children's Home and I said, you know, the church, we did something good with that. And then I, I start looking around and I say, are we really guilty of loving those who love us? Are we really guilty of wanting to hang out with people just like us? Are we really willing to risk hanging out with somebody that's maybe a little weird? 
ever since the pandemic, I've been struggling to try to get the AA folk to restart our AA meeting. It's been, it's been a challenge. The district AA people came and said, oh my gosh, we're going to be here on January the 8th. We're going to get it started. We'll bring some people. They never showed up. So I sort of gave up. Every couple of weeks, somebody trickles in on Saturday nights. We're looking for the AA meeting as well. There's nobody else here. You can meet by yourself. Two young people came in last night. He was uh, looking a bit scraggly. The young lady with him had some interesting piercings. <laughs> and uh, they asked about the AA meeting. I said, I don't think it's going to make, but you're welcome to go in there and wait. They did. Then they came in here to find me, and they said, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? I said, well, if we had some friends... Could we like get them together in that AA meeting and meet there? I said, that's exactly what I've been looking for for like a year. Yes. Bring your friends. I, I'm always amazed, you know, sometimes we do that here at church too. We bring our friends. But I had really given up on that and it was when I was able to give up on it that I think, and we'll see how it all washes out in the end, but God sent somebody to do what needed to be done under God's timing, God's plan, God's way, not mine. Amen. And I think that's where, where I'm at today with the world. I mean, I pray that, that uh, whatever happens in Ukraine doesn't end up being horrible. But you know, out of that, I've also seen a unification of the NATO people that wasn't there before. So maybe out of something comes some strength. Amen. But I know it's in God's timing, not mine. But I can still pray. I don't know. I know God doesn't want anybody to be killed. I know that. I know that God doesn't want people to suffer. So I don't know what to do about it. I mean, we probably can sit around and have a long discussion about it, but that still doesn't fix it for me. I don't know what I can do about it except stand here in the corner of Pasadena and pray for God's will to somehow get involved so that the people of this world, the Christians, the two point some odd billion of us that there are, can start loving others and treating others like we want to be treated. And I can pray for that. Yep. And maybe on a good day I can model it. How about you? Amen. Amen. That's my goal. That's my prayer for our church. As we kind of get through this pandemic and get into uh, the most, one of the most important times of the year we have as we go through Lent and get up to Easter. Uh, I, I even hate to call it revival because it wasn't that great before. <laughs> what I'm talking about is like a Bible. Let's, let's do something new. Let's get some excitement. Let's get some enthusiasm, some passion about the church. I keep thinking about those Green Bay Packer fans. You know, no shirt, two degrees, cheering for their team. Keep your shirts on. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great to just have that kind of passion about God, about God's kingdom? about God's work in the world. Well, there is hope. And there's hope in God. We're finding little ways to make a difference. We're sending some old books that we found no use for to underdeveloped countries. Okay, that's a God thing. We're going to meet some new people, maybe with some chili. We're going to have some fun. We, have, we need to always have fellowship, too. Because it's that dependence upon each other that we have. I really didn't refer, today, refer much today to the Joseph story, but I want to say this about old Joseph. Joseph had a hard time. But Joseph was a brat. I mean, he told his brothers, I'm better than y'all. I'm smarter than y'all. I know more than y'all. And they threw him in a pit. Now they were going to go rescue him, but he was missing by the time they got back. And then they staged a death and they threw in the coat of many colors. That whole story goes along with that. 
But Joseph was perseverant. He didn't give up. He, he went through all kinds of stuff. He got sold into slavery. He got into Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife accused him of stuff he didn't do. He made it all the way through. And every time he was in prison, he came through because he never, ever quit. And ultimately, he was in a place to not only save his family, but to save Egypt. That's what I got from Joseph this week. He never gave up. But you got to remember that last thing he said, or that they tell us in the story. The very last thing. And he kissed all his brothers. And he wept upon them. And then after that, they talked for a while. His brothers were afraid of him. He was Pharaoh's henchman. They, his other friend, he was afraid of them. They tried to kill him. They got together. They bared their soul. Maybe they did unto others as they'd have them do unto you. Maybe they just for a moment loved one another. And once they did that, they were able to talk. I think there's a lesson there for us. We pray it every week for God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven. Look around, folks. Pretty sure it isn't there yet. Nope. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So... You got the message right. Do unto others as you have to unto you. Now the next message is go make disciples. Let's be standing as we sing together. Go make a disciple. presence of the Holy Spirit go with you all. Amen. 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 Yeah,